say the game is getting old. Monday morning and your coffee's cold. Life is not what you want it to be. You need another... Hello, everybody, and welcome to A New Direction. My name is Jay Izzo. As always, I am so glad to be with you because... That's what this show is about. It's about helping people find a new direction, whether it be in their life, their career, their business. And I get to do this every week, and it's like, it's not work. I don't go to work. I get to do something I enjoy that I never thought I was gonna enjoy. I, I, I never thought I was gonna be a writer. I never thought I was gonna be an author. I never thought I was gonna be a public speaker. I never thought I was gonna be doing a podcast, radio show. I never thought I was gonna do any of this. And here I am doing something that I found that I've loved and I get to share it with you. And that excites me. And I just wanna thank everybody on Facebook Live who is joining us right now. We have an amazing show. I know, I say that every time. I say every week. Oh, what an amazing show. Jay, you say it all the time. It's amazing, it's amazing. It is, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, this is an amazing show. I have Tori Eldridge with us today. And she's gonna be with you. Know, she's gonna be, I'm just telling you. You do not want to miss the show. Matter of fact, what I would tell you to do right now is I want you to call somebody and say, I need get, get on Facebook Live because this show, Jay has promised that this show is going to be unbelievable. And it is because Tori is, uh, when, when I introduce her, you, you, to say renaissance woman is not enough, okay? I, that's how I'm going to put this. She is going to empower you in a way that you never thought could be empowered. If you are wondering how to live your life and how to live it better and live it to the full, I am telling you that this woman is going to give you tips to live your life in a better way. I read her book again like I do every week. I read every book. I read it from cover to cover, and I'm telling you she's as empowered as I think I am. She empowered me more, and and I am six foot five, and she is five foot four, and I'm telling you, this 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 woman has empowered me greatly, and so we're going to talk to her later. But you know what? Let's do what we always do to begin the show. And by the way, if you if you got if you don't know, how do I get my friends over to a new direction on the Facebook Live feed? Just tell them to go to andfb.com. A and D, a new direction, fbfacebook.com. That takes you right to my page, and they can just get right on, and they can start watching a new direction just immediately. They can do that. So that's really, really cool. And I also need to say one other thing before we go into our regular spiel. Guess what, folks? iHeartRadio just accepted the show. So this is the first show, first show that we're doing with iHeart. I want to thank the people at iHeart and Spreaker. Thank you so much for accepting the show. And to all the new listeners that I'm going to be having, and I know I've got the potential to have 72 million, and I hope I get all of you. But I'm just telling you thank you from the very beginning, how humbling and how appreciative and how grateful I am that you have chosen to take this brand new show and put it on your platform because it really is is really cool and so iHeart and iHeart Media thank you so much and all the new people who are listening thank you and I do not want to neglect my people on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and Google Play and all the Pod Addict and all the places that people are telling me they're listening I want to thank you as well because because of you I get to continue to do this and you're helping me do what I love and I hopefully I'm fulfilling your life as well because that's really my goal is to help you find a new direction so let's check in today right you know I always check in every Every time we do the show, I believe that we are four-part people. We are physical people, we are mental people, we are emotional people, and we are spiritual people. So on a scale of one to 10, one being miserable, 10 being you cannot get any better, let's talk about you physically. How you doing today? Are you three, are you four, are you six, eight? Where are you at today? So let's talk about what are you doing? What are you doing for yourself? Are you getting out? Are you getting some exercise? How about what are you eating? Right? I, I mean, the folks, do you, know, do you know the biggest mistake I think we make sometimes is we diet? Because you know what happens when we diet? It means we're going to get off it. Okay? You've you got to make a lifestyle change. You want to change your life, make a lifestyle change. And it's within your power to do that. Right? I know it's hard. I'm not saying you've got to make tons of lifestyle change. Remember, it's all about baby steps. If you're a three, then get to a four. And if you can't get to a four, get to a 3.5. Okay, that's all I'm asking you to do. But what can you do to get that baby step to get you moving in the right direction physically? All right? And then let's go mentally. Where are you at? On scale 1 to 10, where are you at mentally? What are you doing to feed your mind? What are you feeding your mind with? How are you growing in knowledge? How are you expanding the both sides of your brain? The left side being the logical side. The right side being that, that creative side. What are you doing to feed your brain? good things and expanding it. Are you learning a new language? Maybe you're learning a new instrument. I hope you are. I think that's great. You're doing both at the same time. Are you reading? Are you doing something to read? Are you expanding your mind and reading? 
what are you doing mentally? Scale of one to 10. Again, right? If, if last week you were a four, I hope you're a 4.25. <laughs> I really do. I don't need you to be a seven, right? And if you are, congratulations. That means you worked really, really hard, all right? So wh- how, what are you going to do to change the mental side? And then what about the emotional side? Right? We, we don't think about it. And, and Tori, when she's with us today, she's going to talk to us about the mental side of this because mentally, I mean the emotional side, because you know what? Our emotions drive behavior. We don't understand that. But you know, so often when we're emotionally ready to go, we can do amazing things, but we also need to be in control of them. She's going to talk about having a calm mind. And, you know, right now I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, and emotions, I watched all the emotions as I'm reading her book. I'm watching all these emotions fly all over the place. People panicked and everything. And, you know, the hurricane's in the ocean. It doesn't need to be in your brain. And so emotionally, can you keep yourself calm in the midst of all these crazy situations? Because I'm telling you, calmness overcomes. And so how well are you doing that emotionally on a scale of one to 10? How well are you able to control your emotions? And not only that, how well are you able to tune in to someone else's emotions? Guys, I'm talking to you here. I get it. We're not very good at emotions sometimes, but guys, we got to be better. Okay. I, I understand that we only have like two emotions and that is that we're angry or that we're, or we're really happy, but we don't have, but we don't have the other emotions and we need to start figuring out these other labels of being frustrated and, and yes, we can be hurt too. It's okay. I'm six foot five. I'm two sixty. I, I can lift a house. I'm just telling you it's okay. You can be hurt. All right. You can be emotionally hurt. So how well are you dealing with your emotions? How well are you doing with all those things? Check yourself out. And then finally, spiritually, where are you at? What are you connected to outside of yourself that you believe in, that you have faith in, that you, that, 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 that you can, that you know that you have a faith in something beyond you. And you say, well, Jay, I don't have a faith beyond me. I'm an atheist. Well, you still do because you believe then that there is no God. So that takes faith. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, you can't be without it. So even if you do believe in a God, great, how's that going? I hope that relationship's going well for you. If you don't and you believe in something else, I, I, tell me how that's moving for you. Some people believe in nature and they believe that connectedness with nature helps them grow and learn and move and turn good for you. And, and if you don't believe in any of that, you're still believing in something. And even if it makes you your own God, and I hope that relationship works out for you as well. So there it is. We checked in with you, and I'm glad that we did that together. Now, I also want to tell you that we have a new sponsor. The sponsor of the show for this week is the La Jolla Book Writers Conference. Whether you're an aspiring author who has yet to put pen to paper, someone intent on writing a book to augment your business, a writer on the cusp of submitting to agents, or someone who wants to know more about the different, ever-evolving methods of publication, the La Jolla Writers Conference is the place for you. And that's October uh, 26th through the 28th at the Hyatt Regency La Jolla. And if you're wondering what this is about each year since 2001, Strategies Literary Development and PR produces the La Jolla Writers Conference. It's a labor of love, pay it forward gathering, teaching the art, craft, and business of writing to aspiring writers of all levels. The conference is non-commercial, informal, and intimate with a maximum of 200 attendees. The entire faculty and staff, including best-selling authors, publishers, agents, screenwriters, writing and PR experts are all volunteers and are available all weekend weekend providing over 70 classes from which to choose. The classes include lecture and interactive group and individual read and critiques. The La Jolla Writer Conference was among the first conferences to address the business of writing in response to the changes in the publishing industry. In a field of over 1,600 conferences, Writers Digest named the La Jolla Writers Conference as one of the top 84 conferences worth your money. You can sign up online or by fax, or just go over to LaJollaWritersConference.com, and that's La Jolla, that's L-A-J-O-L-L-A, and that is La Jolla, California. Check out LaJollaWritersConference.com. It's put on by my publicist, by the way, who is sponsoring the show today. And uh, if you're also listening for, uh, looking for a great publicist, Strategies PR, who actually has moved me into doing all sorts of amazing things and is, doing, is actually published, published out my uh, three other books that are coming out, the Social Media Playbook for Student Athletes, the Social Media Playbook for Coaches and Administrators, and From Farmhand to Businessman, Lessons from the Farm. And I think you're going to be really excited about that book because that's why I wear the cowboy hat and the boots and the belt buckles, because that's how I was raised. So now, without
without further ado, I've taken so much time talking and Tori's waiting patiently on the other end going, when are you going to talk about me? So let me do this. I want you to meet Tori, the author, Tori Eldridge. Tori Eldridge is a Honolulu born writer, a fifth degree black belt ninja and a former actress, dancer, singer on Broadway, television and film. She writes action packed. Cultural, culturally rich thrillers and mystically intriguing suspense. She has taught ninjutsu and empowerment across the USA and has authored Empowered Living, A Guide to Physical and Emotional Protection. And I think she needs to change the title, because, title of that book because it's more than that. I'm telling you, this book is that good. Tori's story, short stories have been published in Running Wild Anthology of Stories 2, Never Fear the Apocalypse, Never Fear the Tarot, and Suspense Magazine's Best of 2014 issue. Her screenplay, The Gift, one of many for Lone Tree Entertainment, you, know, you also you might recognize them from the Equalizer, was a semifinalist for the prestigious Acad Academy Nicole Fellowship. Tori is a proud member of the International Thriller Writers Organization's Horror Writers Association, Women's Fiction Writers Association, and Sisters in Crime. Tori Eldridge and everybody, please welcome Tori to A New Direction. Welcome to A New Direction, Tori. Well, hey, that was some introduction. Nice to meet you, Jay. <laughs> I love you. I read your book. My wife has read your book. And I, I told, I, you don't know this. I, well, I told you, but people don't know this who are watching the show or listening to the show. My wife, I was reading her different things in your book. And my wife said, tell me it's on audio. Tell me this <laughs> book is on audio. Because the nuggets, th this book, the, I know it's called Empowered Living and a guide to physical and emotional protection, but it, this, is, this is empowered living, a guide to living an empowered life. That's what it should be. Because nice. this, this, is, this, is more than, this is more than physical and emotional protection. This, as I read this book, I was like going, this isn't about protecting myself, this is about living a life and living it to the full. Everything that you said in this, in your book, was just chock full. I mean, right out of chapter one, I'm just going to read you a quote from the book, folks. Just listen to this. This is this is how the book kind of starts off. I'm reading chapter one. Confidence is essential to success in anything. We must first believe a thing is possible in order to achieve it. Right? Think about it. Right? Confidence. I, Tori. Confidence. Let's start right there, right? Because you're an extraordinarily confident woman. I love that. I love the fact that you're confident, and you are a Renaissance woman. I mean, look at all the things that you've done. I mean, you, I mean, you, you dance, sing, Broadway, television, film, actress, ninja, <laughs> fiction writer, nonfiction writer. I mean, come on, you can't get any. Well, okay. I mean, I, I'm waiting for the other things. I happen to be. We happen to be Facebook friends, and I happen to be looking. I'm like going, oh, my God, she travels, too. She's a world traveler, and she's got all this stuff. I'm like, that's, I'm like, wow. So it's the confidence. Where, where did you get your confidence from? Uh, you know, confidence is a great word, and I think often misunderstood. Um, and I, the reason I say that is a lot of people say, oh, they're so confident. And in some people's mind, there's a negative connotation to that. And that's the word arrogance. Mm -hmm. And the, what I've found is that it's not about being confident in a way that says, oh, I'm the best at everything. I can do anything I try. Um, you know, I'm always at the top, those sorts of things. Confidence to me is something deeper than that, where you acknowledge a place in yourself that has an inner belief in your ability to learn whatever you need to learn, mm -hmm. to cope with whatever you need to cope with, and to find an empowering perspective that will help you dictate the nature of your experiences. To me, that's confidence. And if you can find that spot inside of yourself, and I truly believe we all have that spot inside of ourselves, and we can lock into that, gosh, what can't we do? What, what aren't we afraid to try? 
I, I agree with you. I, I, but you know what? Confidence isn't easy. I mean, I've only, I mean, if I think if you ask the majority of people and they were being honest and I'm going to be completely honest because I have no reason not to be, <laughs> um, I, I have struggled with confidence from time to time, right? I, I, I have, I have, it, it seems that for people who are highly creative and I am a highly creative type, I, I don't deny that. From time to time, I struggle with confidence. My friends will tell you that there have been moments in my life where I have just struggled and sometimes in my own belief in myself. And, 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 it, and, and I know that. I know that that's happened to me on occasion. And, and then I pull it back together. But I think, do, do, you, do you not think that we all kind of struggle from time to time with our own confidence? Gosh, I know I do. Um, self-doubt. I, I think that's intrinsic in our nature. You know, self-doubt is, is built in there. And, you know, by the way, a lot of that self-doubt is a good thing because it keeps us questioning mm -hmm. our actions and our motivations. Um, it's how we discover new things, how we evolve. So I wouldn't say that self-doubt is uh, intrinsically a bad thing, but it can take over and depress us. It can hold us back. It can deflate our confidence in ourselves. And what I find myself, anyway, I'll speak personally, right? When I have those moments of self-doubt, they are almost always accompanied by obsessive thought. Where, um, where I start getting in these thought loops where I'm going to start thinking about, I'm going to reinforce all these doubts. I'm going to reinforce all of these fears. And that in itself is a really dangerous thing. So if we can catch ourselves when we get into these negative thought loops, these obsessive thought forms that almost always stem from fear, by the way, fear of failure, mm -hmm. failure, fear that we won't be able to survive or cope, fear that we might be wrong. Mm. Fear that we won't be believed, mm. fear that we aren't justified to believe or fear or feel as we do. We can be afraid of all sorts of things, but those are, are really big ones. And when we start feeling those kinds of fears, I think it's really natural for our thoughts to start obsessing on them. I'll take I'll take the fear that we aren't justified to believe what we, you know, how we're feeling or how we're acting, because that's, that's one that really generates a lot of negative, obsessive thought. At, at least for me, I find myself practicing my justification, practicing my argument over and over and over. I'm like, good Lord, Tori, what are you doing? Knock it off. Right. Number one, I think you got this down. You don't need to practice it anymore. Right. I think you're going to remember. Right. <laughs> so if anybody asks you, I, you know, I think you got this down. You don't need to practice. Right. And right. the other thing is you, you don't need to cement that perspective because that's what negative thought does. The more we think about something, the more we fear being wrong and we're going over and over again, all of our fears of being wrong, we're cementing that perspective or we're we're afraid of failure and so we're going over and over all of the things that could happen this and that and the other thing we got ourselves into such a frame of mind and so one of the the best tools that i found there are several but one of them that i find very helpful when i'm battling with confidence when i'm fighting this self-doubt is to pay attention to my thoughts and when they start turning into those negative thought loops i catch myself and i go uh-huh you're doing it again right and i give myself something positive to think about sometimes i even have to preset it you know every time i'm going to go there i'm going to force myself to think about this other thing and usually it's something productive that i should be thinking about right. like something i'm going to be writing or something i'm going to be doing or that sort of thing. But, you know, self-doubt, lack of confidence, it's a, it's a daily practice. It's a daily, I don't want to say struggle, but it's effort. It's a daily mindful effort.
Mm. We're yes. talking with Tori Eldridge. She is, well, she's a Renaissance woman, but she, she, she is just, um, listen, she's a fifth, she's a fifth degree black belt ninja for crying out loud. And she, she, by the way, she was on the love boat, by the way, if you remember, people remember love boat, you know, love boat, right? You remember that song, right? So she was, yeah, with Captain Steubing. Yeah. Those people. So she was on love boat. She was actually a mermaid. Guess who she was with? Terry Hatcher. Hello. Lois Lane. Remember her? Yeah. That's who she was with. Anyway, she wrote this amazing book called Empowered Living. I think it should just end right there. Empowered Living. I know she's got this secondary subtitle called A Guide to Physical and Emotional Protection. But I'm telling you, this is a guide to living. This isn't a guide. I get it. She does some how to protect yourself in bad situations. And by the way, all important. I'm not disregarding that. But dang it, this book is so powerful when it comes to to living. And she is being brought to us today by the La Jolla Writers Book Conference. The La Jolla Writers Conference is at the Hyatt Regency in La Jolla, California, this October 26th through 28th. For nearly two decades, it's a it community has intimate classes, personalized attention, ambiance, and dedicated outstanding faculty have converged to pride and provide an intensive experience where writing not only becomes habit, but habit breeds success and writers become authors. And I don't care whether you're at in your writing career. If you want to learn more about the business of writing, and I'm telling you the book business is murderous. It is hard. It is difficult. And people get discouraged every time I talk about the book business because as an author and who's got three more books coming out, I'm telling you, and Tori will tell you too, this is not an easy business. This is a very difficult business. I'm telling you, you're going to want to go to this conference October 26th through 28th in La Jolla, California, and you want to check it out. It's called the La Jolla Writers Conference. Just go to LaJollaWritersConference.com. And um, again, we're talking with Tori Eldridge here on A New Direction, and you're watching us. Thank you, everybody, by the way, watching us on Facebook Live. It's great to see you out there. So I want to talk about, because what you've just led into here on this issue of confidence, Tori, is something else that you wrote in the same chapter, by the way. By the way, I could have said about 18 other things, but it just led into the next thing I highlight in your book. By the way, your book (laughs) that's on Kindle is nothing but a bunch of four different colors. That's all it is, because the entire book has just been highlighted. Okay, I'm just going to tell you this. (laughs) So, so here, here's the next, here's the next nugget in chapter one. I haven't even gotten out of chapter one yet. I want to get to the other chapters, but I can't even get to chapter one. Be willing to take responsibility for the creation and defense of your own emotional and physical well-being, instead of just relying on others to do it for us. Bam. Do you, do you know what the most common thing as I'm reading this book, do you know what the most common thing that my wife and dog heard the entire last week was this, were these two words? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's all I did for a week. That's when I was reading a book. My, my wife finally had enough, and my dog did too. Go, okay, would you just tell us what you're reading? And I would share them, right? This one, this one was an oh, wow. Be willing to take responsibility for the creation and defense of our own emotional and physical well-being instead of just relying on others to do it for us. Why do we, why do we, I guess it's because, is it because it's easy to worry that we, don't want to take responsibility or the creation or the defense for our own emotional, physical, and I guess mental well-being too, right? I mean, for our own mental, the, the things that we say to us mentally, is it, is it just because it's easy or it's easier to do that? Why don't we want to do that? Gosh, I think that's probably a really complex issue right there. I, I think that it's easier is certainly a factor. I think perhaps a lot of people haven't quite grasped the magnitude of that concept. They may not truly believe that we're capable of it. So many times we look at the conditions in our lives, at things that are happening to us, and we say, and quite frequently, quite accurately, there's nothing we could do about that. It happened. It happened to us. Mm -hmm. And when enough of those things happen and when our perspective is focused on these things happening to us, I think what happens is we stop even thinking that we have the the ability to create, that we have the ability to create not only our perception of what's happening to us, but by changing our perception, changing our actions, and effecting 
the nature of things that are likely to happen to us. We have a lot more power than we believe ourselves to be. And it really starts for me with this place of personal responsibility and ownership, taking ownership for our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual well-being, mm. our balance, our strength, and realizing that we can take control and power over these things regardless of what happens in the outside world, what is happening to us. I, I try not to think of events as being good or bad. I try to let events be neutral. And I try not to look at a moment, a party, a, uh, a, something that happens in business, an announcement, an occasion as being inherently good or bad. I try and let it be neutral. Mm. Let something be neutral. Right. And when it's neutral, I find that I'm able to find all sorts of positive emotions and experiences out of that. And when I'm able to do that, that empowers me to feel as though I am creating my experience of my world. And even if somebody else would look at something and say, oh, wow, that was that was a really bad time. People look at, at the last couple of years of my life and go, whoa, you had two parents who were both incredibly sick. You were right there. You were holding their hands while they died. You had to do all this. You, your hip went all to heck. You, you were crippled. You had to have a hip replacement. You didn't have the money for it. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. All these things, I've had so many people say, whoa, you had a really bad year. You had a really bad two years. Right. And I right. say, I didn't have a bad two years. I had a full two yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. And, I, yeah. That's beautiful because, right, we have the, pow we have the power to, I think we, one of the things, we have the power to change our perspective on what we see. I think one of the things that, you know, I, I love telling people, you know, I'm, my psychological background is such that, you know, it's, it may be difficult, but we do have the power within us to change our perspective and our attitude. If there's anything that we can control, it is our attitude towards something. And, you know, I'm hearing you say, I had a hip replacement, two sick parents and whatever else happened in your life and maybe there was all sorts of other things that were just not going the way that you would prefer them to go, but you still have a choice over your attitude. You still have that choice uh, and, 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 and as you say, you have a responsibility to creating that mental, emotional, physical space of, of I do have a responsibility because you know what, this is my life, the only one I've got. Right. You know, and I, I, I want to be in charge of living it as best I can. And, you know, a lot of people think that I'm giving or other people because it's not an uncommon thought to say we have control over our attitude over what happens to us. You know, people hear that a lot. And I think a lot of times people wonder, well, is that just lip service? I mean, come on, your parent died. It's bad. Right. No, no, it's not. It's a neutral event. Right. Right. No, but I get my it. My father died. It was a neutral event. Right. right. Every event, when I look at every event as being neutral, it opens me up to find beauty, poignancy, meaningfulness, joy, right. humor at the oddest moments. Sure. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I had a cousin who was murdered. It was a very, it, it was a tragic thing. And she had a memorial and this was many, many, many years ago. And I was traveling with my father to this memorial in another city and he was dreading it. To him, what could be worse 
right, than going to the memorial for his murdered niece and being with family under these circumstances. And he was absolutely dreading this terrible, depressing, sad event. I, on the other hand, was looking at it as an opportunity to be with family, an opportunity to reconnect in a way that was really significant and deep. I was looking at it as an opportunity to remember my cousin and to celebrate her life and to mourn her passing. And I have to tell you, it was a wonderful time. Oh, it was a wonderful time. And the memorial itself, it was, oh, it was so poignant. And we smiled and laughed and cried. And it it was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing. And these were two completely different sets of expectation that my father had and that I had. And I think because he was in my circle of energy, he started to change along the way. And when we came back on the plane ride back, he had to admit, you know, that that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to (laughs) be. It it was actually kind of nice here and there and the other thing. And I tell you, if he hadn't been traveling with me, he would have had a lousy time and he would have come back with the same impression as was his expectation, which was this was going to be horrible. So when I say I try and look at events with neutrality, that's that's what I mean. When I spent 52 hours in my mother's hospital room um, it, during her last hours of life, that was one of the most uh, amazing experiences. Oh. I was so privileged. I was honored. We were so close. I had an opportunity to care for her, to watch out for her, to be her guardian. Wow. It was It was incredibly powerful and very meaningful. And I felt... I knew that she was there. I walked into the door and she said, oh, thank yeah. God for you. Yeah. And so she knew I was there and we shared that and we closed the end of her life with just an incredible love and bond. How is that bad? How is that a horrible no, thing? It, no, 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 Tori, listen, I, we went through the same thing with Linda's mom in 2012 and I held her, we both held each of her hands as she breathed her last breath and it was one of the most beautiful things uh, I've ever been a part of. I'm, I'm just telling you, it was, there was something so precious and so meaningful and so real. It was, it was like she was, she said she didn't want to be alone. That was the one thing she said she just didn't want to be alone. And here we were holding her hand as she took her final breath. And it was like, we gave her every, the, the very thing that she desperately feared she didn't have to fear and it was beautiful it was it was just it was beautiful so when you say that and i hear you say that i'm like yes uh, yes absolutely tori that is absolutely correct we're we're talking with tori eldridge by the way she is author of a phenomenal book by the way get it on amazon just just god you got to get this book it's called empowered living and the, the subtitle is a guide to physical and emotional protection, but this is, this is more, this book is more than self protect, protecting yourself. This is about living an empowered life. Like you've never lived it before. That's what this book is. I'm just, I'm just telling you it is, it touches on so many more topics than, um, we're going to be able to get to today because this book is so, so powerful. And I got to be honest with you when I will tell you that, you know, I read a lot of books because I read a book a week, right, in in preparing for my authors. But this book is really, I believe, is a life changer for either either yourself or for someone else. I I believe that with all my heart that and, and ladies, I really want you to read this book because there's a whole section towards the end on defending yourself physically and rape and everything that she covers that is just absolutely powerful. And I need to do that. I want to, but I want to talk about another subject with you, Tori, that you hit. And I want to have some fun because we've, we've gone deep. And I want to have some fun. So you, and I think it's a chapter two, maybe chapter three. And anyway, so you say, you know, men and women are wired differently for a specific purpose. And, and you said that together, men and women are synergistic. 
and I love, first of all, whenever anybody uses the word synergy or synergistic, I'm like, okay, you, you just, you bought me in. They are also non-exclusive. Men can be caring, empathetic, and introspective. Women can be fierce, decisive, and assertive. But men and women do not tend to perceive and approach the same task or quality from different perspectives. Um, so kind of move me into this men and women's thing and how we view, how we view that. The, you know where I'm at in the book with that? I do. Yeah, okay. So because I I found this to be really, really true. My, my wife is your height and your size, right? She's this little, she's this five foot four, 110 pound woman who could kick my left cheek with her right foot, okay? <laughs> All right. And so, you know, and, and here I am, this giant weightlifting guy have been my whole life. And, uh, but I am, I can be incredibly caring. Matter of fact, she will say I'm more emotional than she is. Right. And I have more empathy maybe than she does. And I, but we're both terribly introspective, but it works because she gives me boundaries that I need. Um, so but help us, help me move through this, this thing about the wiring and men can be caring as women can be fierce, decisive. I love that by the way, men, women can be fierce decisive and assertive because my wife certainly fits that but men and women do tend to perceive and approach the same task or quality from different perspectives how does that all fit help me work through that well to me it's just obvious but i think we spend a lot of time especially we women who are always striving for empowerment striving to have our voices heard striving to be respected in a workplace and these days my goodness that certainly comes up a lot and i think there is there's a danger of in in doing so trying to homogenize men and women Mm -hmm. I think we have the ability to have all of these same traits, all of these similar traits, and that will change with individuality. One woman is different than another, a man is different than another man, woman, whatever. The point is we have access to a full range of emotions, of qualities, of approach, all of these things, but at the same time, we are biologically geared to different purposes. Men do not carry babies in their stomachs for nine months. The no, fact that no, we, we can don't. do Thank, that. Thankfully, we don't. I'm actually, I'm actually grateful that I don't. So, okay, so you can have that one. Okay, I'm okay with that, that I don't do that. That's all right. I'm all right. Go ahead. Yeah, but you know what? It, it affects how we perceive the world. I mean, keep in mind that we are, we are a gender that if we have children will be in lesser physical commission for a whole lot of months, which means we won't be able to lift things as heavy as we might have been able. We won't be able to run as fast, that's a big one, right? right? Won't be able to run from the saber tooth tiger <laughs> as fast as we could have. <laughs> we are at a, a point in our life where we need some caring and additional protection. Mm -hmm. And when that baby is born, imagine us out in the wilderness, when that baby is born, it becomes very difficult to do everything we would need to do because at some point or another, we're either carrying that child on our person, which makes us slower and makes our attention more defensive, right? Or we have to leave the child right. in a safe den to go out and do these things. So we're in a place where we are inclusive in that in that realm now men on the other hand you don't have that you don't have this creature living in you for this long and you're not generally the ones responsible for the care of that creatures every need when they're very little you're the one who's out there protecting the family, gathering the food. I mean, I'm really going back to what's what's a basic, right? But I think that affects how we 
approach things in life. I think it makes women more geared, more geared, right? Not exclusively, but more geared to empathy. Why? Because of a child. We need to tune into that child. I don't know, you know, any of you out there who had a baby, but oh my goodness, this baby cries. And if you can figure out what this baby needs in the first five seconds, power to you. Because sometimes it goes on for an hour or two, only to find out that the thing the baby wants is the first thing you offered the baby. And so, so there, this is when, right, this is when empathy, self-questioning becomes very important. The ability to perhaps not think of ourselves as always right, absolutely, you know, we're just going to head out there and plow, plow our direction. It's to our advantage to go, hmm, you know, maybe that wasn't right. Maybe this isn't right. What is this person feeling? How does this person need? It's helpful to us in what we're biologically geared to do, to be thinking those things, which is probably why those things come, generally speaking, easier for us than they do to, for generally speaking, most men. Men, on the other hand, right, if you're going to sit there and think about what is that deer feeling? I don't know. I mean, can I really, my family's hungry, I get that, but that deer is out there and they're living life. No, shoot the deer, (laughs) dress the deer, bring it home, feed your family. (laughs) So from that point of view, I think men are biologically geared to be more decisive, to be more direct. They may not be right. Right. So what? They're going to go out there and they're going to do it. And if they're wrong, you know what? They'll deal with it. They'll change course. Right. And I think that attitude makes it, easier for men, generally speaking, to have less self-doubt. And on the other side of that coin, possibly uh, get themselves overconfident and uh, arrogant. There is that, you know, to to every good side, there is a bad. But I think that decisive, assertive, action-oriented, don't worry about whether I'm right or wrong, that we need to do it now. Right. As opposed to this, let me take in your feelings. Let's see how you're feeling. Is this right? Is that right? I may not have this quite right, but I've got to get everybody in the family and this baby and the husband and everything. So even if we never have a child, even if we are never married, even if we're never in a relationship, these differences, I believe, are are to our are wired in us on such a biological level. So I don't think this um, inhibits us. No. Like I said, I have been called a fierce, assertive, <laughs> decisive woman. Right. I have been called that. I've also been called <laughs> the opposite of sure. all of those things. So I'm saying that absolutely, I can be strong. I can be as assertive as you. I can be as tough as you. I can be as fierce. I can be as courageous. All of those things, not a problem. And likewise, you for all those nurturing qualities. Right. But I'm still a woman. Sure. I'm still looking through life hmm. from a different perspective, even as I get all of these, enhance all of these other qualities about myself. And I, I guess that's where I was going with it. Yeah. Some people may disagree with me, but that's no, kind of where I'm coming from. No, I, oh, I, no, I, I think, well, first I, of all, I think well, every I, woman just, just stood up and cheered uh, wherever they're sitting. <laughs> and if you were in your car, don't, don't stand up and cheer. That would be dangerous for you. So don't do that. But. No, I think I think they did because, you know, one of the things that you're saying in all of this, Tori, and we're by the way, we're talking with author Tori Eldridge, actually Renaissance woman Tori Eldridge, black belt ninja Tori Eldridge, uh, the, the actress, singer, dancer Tori Eldridge, uh, world traveler Tori Eldridge, uh, fiction writer, nonfiction writer, author Tori Eldridge, uh, she, re, Renaissance woman is the best thing, Tori Eldridge, uh, but I think. You know, one of the things that you just did for all of us, I don't care if you're male, female, I don't care who you are. And and I don't know that you recognized what you did there, but one of the most beautiful things that you just said is you have taken the time to look at both male and female, right? And you took, a, you took and you understand it. And it's not like you go, oh, they're bad or we're better or they're better and we're bad. 
it is what it is. There is a wiring there that does seem to, generally speaking, I'm, naturally there's exceptions, but generally speaking, that, that biologically pushes us in a certain direction, both male and female. And, but I think the fact that you recognize that is what's powerful because I think what most people don't do, Tori, is that I think we don't try to understand the other side as a man, right? I mean, I mean, I, I think it's important that we understand this is, you know, a woman is wired this way. And we need to understand that because the more that, and you know, John Gray, you know, right? Dr. John Gray, who wrote Men Are From Mars and Men Are From Venus, we, you know, really tried to get us both sides to understand we're kind of wired differently and we need to understand that wiring and what it does for us because, you know, what it, if we do understand it, it's much easier to deal with that other person instead of complaining about him complaining about the other person, you know, the other half, whether it's male or female. And I think that's something that you, you know, just said in, in, without actually saying it is that you've, you've taken the time to really analyze both sides. You know, you look at it from a male. Uh, yeah. I, I appreciate that. And again, uh, it's another place for neutrality. As I do that, I don't look at the traits of either side as being good or bad. Right. I think, right. A lot of times we get into trouble when we're speaking in, you know, men and women. And like you were saying, oh, the, the you know, men can get down on the way women are feeling or things like that. And, and so often, I think, with all the struggle that women have had over the decades of finding respect and finding empowerment and finding their place, their equality in society. And by the way, I mean, we can open this up, not even just to women right. uh, and not even just to cisgender women. Right. Um, too often, I think when we're looking at these qualities, we have some of us in our head already a negative connotation to certain words. Hmm. Like we look at assertive and we say, that's good. Mm -hmm. And we look at caring and we think that's weak. Oh, wow. And, and not everybody, but some people sure. do. And if you look at a, if you name like a list of a hundred traits and you were to go through and say, which traits do I want? Which traits do I think I am? Right. Try it sometime. You're going to find yourself unconsciously going, oh, I don't want that one. That one's, that one's not good. That one's weak. That you're one's right. strong. That one's, oh, I want that one. That's a really good one. And you're going to go these things because somewhere in us we've already attached this judgment absolutely to these qualities you, you, and, and I, I don't think we need to do that no you I mean just as you said it right we said I mean and, and folks tell me if you agree right you heard the word assertive and you go oh yeah I like that that's strong yeah <laughs> right every guy goes yep I'm a strong and even the women are going yeah that makes me feel good and then you said caring and everybody's shoulders kind of drop I know that's kind of weak Right. I'm kind of caring, you know, that there's no strength in caring. Right. I mean, kind of, because we do that, right. We make this, I mean, words do <laughs> words. We judge words. Right. And if somebody is described as, oh, she's really assertive. Right. Well, depending on who you're from, actually, we know it's strong, but it may be viewed negatively if a woman has said she's assertive. OK, because we will sometimes still attribute the word assertiveness to a more male characteristic. Right. So we're even making that judgment. Right. Where we'll we'll attach either a, a gender to a descriptor. Which I, I think is a huge mistake because well, it's a neutral. These words are neutral. And then all of a sudden we've created some sort of power play with these descriptor <laughs> words I, and I, and, and, and you're so right. That's the beauty of it. Okay. Okay. So Tori, I got, I want to move on to another piece. Cause I'm, I'm any one of these things, by the way, is a show, you know that, right? We could do an <laughs> hour on any one of these topics, but there was one topic that, there's actually several topics, but this one topic I want to hit because I know that this particular topic is something that we all deal with. And everybody deals with it. Even if they don't want to admit, admit it, they deal with it. And it's fear, right? And I loved your chapter on fear. I just loved your chapter on fear. Because I am a guy 
I'm a person. I'm a guy, but I'm a person. I, can a guy be a person? Is that okay? Is that <laughs> okay? Is that is all right? Good. Is all right, folks. Is, if a guy can be a person, I'm sorry, I'm a guy. I'm not a person. So, but I am a believer uh, as a psychological professional and as just a practical coach to to people who coach uh, people and businesses and does it in a practical way. I'm I'm a believer that you don't fear is something that you don't get rid of. It's, it's, and you say it this way, you say, we don't need to eliminate fear. We need to overcome it on those occasions when it ceases to serve and, and, and instead consumes. And, uh, I am a believer and I think we say the same thing. I didn't, I've never used the word overcome, but I just do things afraid. I mean, the fact of the matter is when I was bouncing and doing some bodyguarding and that type of thing, which is not the most pleasant job in the world to do, but when you're my size, it kind of comes with the territory as you're working your way through college and grad school. One of the things that is that uh, I, I, there's always a little bit of fear. And because you, you don't know if somebody's gonna pull up with a knife or a, you know, or a weapon or use a glass. You know, I've seen, I saw other bouncers get hit with the back end of a 14 ounce rocks glass, right? And put a big, huge guy down in a heartbeat. And, you know, so you always had to be cautious. And there is a little bit of fear and apprehension. If you don't have a healthy dose of that, you're a moron, I believe. But I was doing it afraid. Because the fear, I actually thought the fear was a good thing for me. I thought that the fear drove me to a place that would allow me to protect the patrons in a restaurant, right? Or the restaurant itself or the, or the music venue I was at and protect other people who were trying to enjoy the music venue or protect the artist that I happened to be in charge of that evening. And so I always felt that that was just a healthy thing for me. So let's talk about fear because I love this opening statement. We don't need to eliminate it. Am I on the right track here? Tori? You're on a, a very good track. And I love everything and agree with everything you're saying. And the most important part of that say, that sentence that you read of mine is the end. We need to overcome fear when it ceases to serve. Right. Or consumes us. Or consumes us. And yeah. what you were talking about, your fear as a bodyguard, that is serving you. Right. And it is serving others. It's important. Um, fear helps us to make the right decisions. Agreed. Helps us to not act rashly. We need to take these things into consideration when we take on or leave a job, a project, when we step out into that dark alley, when we decide to have a drink at a bar with strangers and walk away from that glass and come back to it. We need to have fear. We need to be right. aware. Fear, again, it's neutral. It's not a bad thing. I agree. It's agree. not a good thing. It exists. Right. And we all feel it. At some point or another, we all feel fear. Right. And so when I just stop thinking about it as good or bad, then it becomes, what is the fear doing in my life? Is it helping me to become uh, more empowered or is it hindering me and causing me to be frightened and depressed and uh, unwilling to pursue all the things that I want to do? or to reach out to that person I really want to reach out to, or whatever that is. So again, I think it, it comes down to what is the nature of this fear? Right. And is it serving you or is it consuming you? Yeah, and, and, and can I tell you something about fear? As someone who coaches, like you do, you know, I know that you, uh, you know, coach uh, folks, and, and whether it be life coaching or business coaching, and I know you do some of that, and I do as well. And fear is so crippling. And, and can I, I want to read you another quote that just, this was one of those quotes again that my, I just went, oh, wow. Listen to this quote, folks. Our minds are adept at self-trickery and we can easily disguise our fear, God, this is beautiful, in a labyrinth of justification and false evidence. 
I, <laughs> that is one of the most beautifully written sentences I have ever read in a book. Our minds are adept at self-trickery and we can easily disguise our fear in a labyrinth of justification and false evidence. It's just a matter of highlighting that which supports our desires and blacking out that which negates it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Because you know what? That's the, that's the problem with fear. The problem, you know, whenever I'm coaching somebody, whether it's a life coaching situation or whether it's a business coaching situation, and, or sometimes even with myself, my mind is so good at tricking myself into disguising that I'm afraid to just to somehow justify my fear in some other way. Right. Yeah. It's what, it's what I do. Right. So, you, you know, because it's that, and I think it's that way for all of us is that we, we have this tendency to justify our fear and, and we put, we put it and we, and fa- I lo- talk about this sentence because it's just beautiful. It's two beautiful sentences. I'm just going to give it to you. Over to you, Tori. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought you were doing great. I'm, I could listen to no, you all day. <laughs> I'm over to you, Tori. I'm done talking. Go ahead. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think I think we basically took care of that. Uh, if we can just look at fear as being neutral. But when you're talking about uh, self-trickery, oh, my gracious me, aren't we good at that? Yeah, we are good. Oh, I, I know I am. Um, and I try to be mindful and I'm still adept at self trickery. Mm. So when I find myself, uh, talking up too big of a game, Mm. when I'm mm, obsessing a bit too much and justifying my position or especially defending my right to my fear, when I find myself putting a little too much energy in defending my right to be afraid, I have to say, you know what? I have a feeling, (laughs) I have a feeling there's some self trickery going on. I think I need to look a little deeper. So when I find myself getting obsessed with fear, with, you know, any of those fears that I was talking about before, be they physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, relationship oriented, business oriented, writing oh my gosh isn't there a lot of fear consumed with uh, trying to become a writer i i have to stop and i have to go inside and find that quiet little place where where everything is good and everything is calm and where i know everything will be fine and say what what is this about right where is this fear coming from right you know, what, what am I, what, what is really going on here? Right. And sometimes if I really just stop all this obsessive thought nonsense, I can get to the bottom of that. And very frequently, it's not what I thought it was. Mm-hmm. It's something less obvious. It's something more deeply rooted. It's like ever, <laughs> I have kids, so uh, something happens, and, and one of the first things I asked was, well, what just happened before that? And what happened before that? And what happened before that? And you can get to the source of what's really at the heart of this problem. And so when I find myself consumed by especially irrational fear or obsessive fear, I stop and I tune in frequently in the form of meditation, sometimes on a walk, Mm -hmm. sometimes I'll just sit and stare at a garden and get to the bottom of this. What is at the core of this fear? And often it's not the thing that I'm spending so much time justifying. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's, it's so interesting because I had somebody write on the face who's watching Facebook, her name's Muriel. And she's like, give me an example of trickery. <laughs> 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 and um, I, I just I just was answering her back. So hopefully she covered that for you because you, before you, as we were talking about it, she was writing that uh, on the Facebook live page. Um, Tori, say hi, say hi to Muriel. She's watching. Would you just say hello to Muriel? Hey, Muriel. That's awesome. Uh, I hope I answered your question. If not, um, just go ahead and ask it again. But in regards to self-trickery, we, we can delude ourselves 
we can delude ourselves a number of ways. We can we can delude ourselves into here's an example feeling that our actions are coming from a noble mm. selfless yes. place yes. when in fact they are being driven by something petty perhaps say envy um jealousy perhaps coming from a place uh that's more self-serving uh, protecting somebody in a way that inadvertently keeps them down and therefore allows us a way to move higher. I'm just throwing out um, examples, and these are sort of negative, she, I guess she, you would she, say. She got it. Just, I just got they're not serving me, and they're certainly not serving the other person. Sure. And when I'm not serving the other person from a genuine place, you know what? I am hurting me. And so it really is important that I am clear about my intentions and my motivations. Here's another example. Have you ever noticed where you say something and uh, you thought you were real careful about that and you were misconstrued and the person, you know, took issue. But when you really looked in and nobody was around and you didn't have to admit it to anybody, could you say that, you know what, the way they misconstrued my words, mm. they really hit exactly what I was feeling. <laughs> <laughs> right? Sometimes we feel something and we think we're being so clever about how we say it that, you know, we'll get off the hook and they won't realize that we're how we really feel. And they do mm. because, you know what, our intentions come through. So it, it you know, just one of many, many ways that... Our, so, our challenge for self trickery. I, so that, it's it's awesome because I, Muriel said, "Ah, yes, she gave me that." Oh, cool. Yeah. So <laughs> so you did. You answered a question, Darlene. Um, hi, welcome. Glad that you're watching the show. I know that you're a regular watcher of the live show. So thanks, Darlene. Um, um, as a matter of fact, Muriel says that's happened to me many times. LOL. That's what she just wrote back on. <laughs> Hasn't it happened to all of us? <laughs> <laughs> it has. It has happened to all of us. Uh, I, I could be talking with you for another hour, but I've been with you for over an hour. <laughs> and no kidding. No. But you know, I love significant conversations. And so this is, this is like my favorite kind of conversation. So the time just flies. It, it, it just flew away from us. And I, I, I know that people are going, no, don't, don't stop. Keep going. <laughs> but I know that, uh, that first of all, can we do this again in the future? Because I, sure. I mean, everybody would everybody would love to 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 do more of the book. The book, uh, by the way, this is uh, you. I've been talking to Tori Eldridge, but you, you need to look it up. Just go to Tori T O R I Eldridge dot com, and just go to meet Tori because I'm I'm telling you, she she is amazing. Uh, like I said, Renaissance woman is doesn't even do enough. Fifth degree black belt ninja. Actress, dancer, singer. By the way, there's no such thing as former, because you could still do, you could still do all those things. I promise you, you can. I, I it's it's like, you know, when I did I did acting on stage, right? I can still do it. It's just that I'm not currently doing it. So I still say that I act. It's just that I don't currently do it. So I still am an actor, and I think you're still a dancer. I, and by the way, I've had a knee replacement, and I still lift, squat, deadlift, because I don't care. Just like hip replacements or whatever, I don't care. I'm going to do what I need to do to keep my body in condition. So I'm I'm not one of those people. So when I heard you say that you had to, right? You said you had to have your hip replaced? I did. Yeah, right. Boy, was that a shocker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a shocker, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it when that happens to you and you go, What? No, I, yeah, I, I was pretty. I was pretty surprised. <laughs> it's like what? No, uh, singer on Broadway, television, and film. Uh, she writes action-packed, culturally rich thrillers, and mystically intriguing suspense. Uh, she has taught ninjutsu empowerment across the USA. She, the, the book that we have been discussing today is Empowered Living: A Guide to Physical and Emotional Protection. I want you to go get the book. Uh, get the Kindle version. Get the get the get the get the paperback version. Just just get. Yeah, actually, there's only a Kindle version. The paperback oh. version was a smaller book that came out. And by the way, you know why it's called a guide to physical and emotional protection? Because it started out as 
is really being more about that and the emotional and mental aspects were there to connect mm. with people on a physical level so that I could offer very real, applicable advice and principles for physical protection that you could learn by practicing and applying them in emotional and daily life. And that's how this book began. And then I ended up doing an expanded version. Right. Uh, after that paperback went out of book, uh, out of out of print, I did an expanded version, increased it by 30% and changed the the real emphasis mm. to be exactly what you're talking about, about um, ways of living a more empowered, fulfilled mm -hmm. life. And but I but I couldn't change the title <laughs> because uh -huh. it, it had a lot of the same content right. plus 30 percent more and so many anecdotes and all of these things. But I very intentionally only made it an ebook okay. because okay. I wanted it to be accessible right. and inexpensive Sure. because sure. I want that information out there. Right. I want anybody who wants it to have it. Awesome. awesome. Can I, I we we can I encourage you author to author? Can I encourage you to do an audible version of this book, please? Funny that you mentioned that. It is <laughs> on my list of things to do. Awesome. Uh, I'm holding off on that because mm, uh, there. Well, it's a, it's it's in my thought. Okay. And I really appreciate you mentioning it and you're not the first. Okay. Yeah. No. First of all, you have a great voice. I mean, clearly you have a very powerful commanding voice. And so, I mean, you would be great reading your own book. I, I did my own book. I read my own book as well. I think you would be great doing that. And, but I, I just really think that you have something here that is not just something that people can read. We don't have that many readers left in America. Max, matter of fact, folks, that's true. I, was at a I was at a book publishers conference a couple of years ago. You realize, right? There's only about 83 million people left in the United States who actually read, seriously, and only 33 million of those 83 are avid readers. So um, that 33 million. So that tells you that we don't have very many readers. But more and more people are listening to aud audible books, and that's well. I have to admit, I love audible books. I'm always reading a book right. and listening to a book simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of people, a lot of people. Different books, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, of course, yeah, yeah, no, no, I get it, yeah, yeah. So, w by the way, today's show, I need to do this, Tori, and we'll get back to you, because so, I gotta, gotta give my sponsor a plug here. By the way, Tori Eldridge and A New Direction has been brought to you today by the La Jolla Writers Conference on October 26th through 28th. Uh, whether you're an aspiring author who has yet to put pen to paper, someone intent on writing a book to augment your business, a writer on the cusp of submitting to agents, or someone who wants to know more about the different and ever-evolving methods of publication, the La Jolla Writers Conference is a place for you. For nearly two decades, community intimate classes, personalized attention, ambiance, and a dedicated and outstanding faculty have annually converged to provide an intensive experience where writing becomes habit, habit breeds success, and writers become authors. All these best-selling authors, publicists, are that will be there over the weekend. There's going to be 70 of them, more than 70 of them. They, they volunteer their time, and these are top writers. So if you're interested in learning about the writing business, you're interested in learning how to become an author and understanding this crazy business that Tori and I are in, you need to really check out the La Jolla Writers Conference. Just go to LaJollaWritersConference.com. Again, it's October 26th through 28th. It will be held at the Hyatt Regency in La Jolla, California. It, I, I really can't encourage you more. As a matter of fact, um, I was planning on being one of the speakers at this conference. I can't make it this year because I'm actually traveling, but I plan to be there next year and be speaking at this conference as well. So uh, great, it's, it's awesome. And also if you're looking for a great publicist, I'm telling you Strategies PR, who is my publicist who's been putting this on since 2001, uh, one of the top 84 writing conferences in the country, I highly suggest that you do that. Tori, I, I've, I've had this amazing time with you, and I, I don't want it to end. And I know that the people that are watching this show, uh, thanks. Uh, matter of fact, I have uh, Muriel saying thank you, um, Jay and Tony, and please come again. And Tori, please come again. And Anthony gives us the thumbs up. And so, Tori, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for writing this book. I want to thank you for being so 
um, gracious to be on the show. And before we say um, goodbye uh, on the show, I would love you to maybe give our folks, um, give our folks one last nugget to help them find a new direction in their life or their career or their business. Uh, Sure, I'd be happy to. I think one of the most important things is to find and maintain emotional equilibrium. And there is a quiet place, I mentioned this before, within all of us, where we feel calm and where things are manageable, regardless of what is happening to us on the outside. It's a place of security and optimism that assures us that all is and all will be fine. And when we're in touch with this quiet confidence, we are able to meet any challenge with intelligence, patience, and wisdom. And when we're not, our actions tend to reflect chaotic fear, emotions, we jump to the worst conclusion, explode all over the place at the smallest infractions. All heck breaks loose when we lose this sense of emotional equilibrium. So what I want to say is there is a spot inside all of us where this lives. And if we can access it, I find that the best way of accessing it, for me at least, is through meditation, being quiet. It doesn't have to be elaborate. There doesn't, it doesn't have to be long. Just stop what you're doing, sit well, breathe, tune into the moment, and look. Look for that spot somewhere in you that feels quiet and enjoy it and become familiar with it and become familiar with the path to get there. And the next time that you're feeling anxious, follow that path and go to that place of inner quiet. That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Tori Eldridge. She's awesome. The book, you gotta go grab it. I'm telling you, do me a favor, go grab this book on Kindle, just just grab it. It's, it's, it's called Empowered Living, A Guide to Physical and Emotional Protection, but it's far more than the title suggests, far more. Go to Kindle, get it, read it, highlight it with every color. You only got four, highlight it, do that, because it's gonna be amazing. Tori, thank you so much. I am so grateful, as I told you, I am absolutely grateful. And, I'm, and we're gonna do this again, because we're gonna talk some more, because you are an amazing guest. You're just an amazing human being. And I just thank you for your generosity and your time. So thank you so much. And folks, remember, you wanna create a new direction in your life, be inspired. Because when you choose to be inspired, that means that you can inspire someone else. And when you inspire someone else, you can get them motivated to do something else. And that can be change. And while change can be, as Tori has written, change can be scary. And change can be hard. And even though that may be the case, I'm telling you, change is absolutely necessary in order for all of us to become everything that we were intended to be. So... Folks, have yourself a great rest of your week. We will see you next week on A New Direction. And hey, check us out, iHeartRadio. Yeah, you can find us there now, as well as iTunes and everywhere else you want to. Thanks and have a great time. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. Your dreams will take you
places you have never 